Hey, hello. Welcome once again uh, to the 17th annual Newburyport Documentary Film Festival. Um, I am Program Director James Sullivan, and we are interviewing the filmmakers of the feature films that we'll be presenting at our festival in a couple of weeks, beginning September 17th. Mark your calendars. And uh, we, today we have the, the director of a film called The Last Light Keepers, which is uh, a feature film about the history of lighthouses up and down the New England coast, and also about those who are dedicated to their preservation. Um, it's a really beautiful film about the place that we call home. Director Rob Apps is with us. I will introduce him in a moment, but in the meantime, let us take a look at the trailer for the film. Pretty good now. I'm going. Got the bow line? Yeah. You may hit the rocks on the way in. Here we go. I definitely think... Uh, history is on the back burner in our public schools uh, and private schools. There's just so much more to learn as time goes by. So where do we put this very important topic? I don't understand why it's sitting there when there were opportunities to save it. It's striking to be here, and some people just weren't acquainted enough with what this was like, and they thought I was nutty. And for the most part, when people get out here and see what a dramatic place this is and how historically significant this lighthouse is, they tend to have a better understanding of why I'd be passionate about this place. Anybody who loves lighthouses, anybody who cares about lighthouses, has to make themselves into one of the last light keepers. Joining us from his home in the great state of New Hampshire is filmmaker Rob Apps. Hi, Rob. How are you? Hi, James. I'm doing well. Thank you uh, for having me today and uh, letting me be a part of this festival. Really excited for it. So it's actually your second time in the festival. You had a film here six or seven years ago, I think, uh, called uh, short film, Stones of the Quarries, correct? That That's right. And, and the crazy thing about that, that was the first festival I was ever um, accepted into. And that film actually inspired this film. So it's cool to see everything kind of come full circle on that. Oh, that's great. Very cool. Um, so go ahead and tell us a little bit about the idea behind making this film last light keepers. We were just talking before we got started here about some of the characters that you come across, you know, there's some sort of historic figures in the history of new England lighthouses. Um, there's some present day authors who are pretty noteworthy, uh, who, some of whose names our, our, our viewers are going to be familiar with. Um, what made you decide to focus on this lighthouse? you know, the story of the lighthouses? Yeah, so this was um, this was a really long journey for me as well. Um, it really started about five years ago. So in 2000, you know, 14, 15 was really where the idea started kind of generating in my in my mind. And um, I had uh, I had traveled out to Graves Light in Boston Harbor with um, the owner Dave Waller at the time, and I was filming that that short film, The Stones of the Quarries, which was you know an exploration of of where all these these stones went um, from the quarries in, in Cape Ann and Graves Light was one of them. And so as I got out there and learned about Dave who had purchased this lighthouse, um, it was a really unique story and I didn't even know you could purchase a lighthouse. I didn't even know they were they were coming up for auction if um, nonprofits weren't weren't taking them on. That's the case for a lot of offshore lighthouses. They go to, to a private auction and go to private ownership because um, they're just so difficult to to maintain, to preserve, um, it's really expensive um, and you really need a passion to do that. And so, um, I kind of dug in more and saw that more lighthouses were coming up for auction. And so I just looked more into the history of lighthouses and came across um, Jeremy Dontremont, who's a, a local historian. Um, he is, I believe he still is the president of the American Lighthouse Foundation um, and the president and founder of the Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. And so when I got talking to him, he kind of introduced me to these this this whole world and all these characters and people. And there's there's so many stories. So that was one of the the challenges of, of making this film was was figuring out who to talk to and how to get out to them and, and how to explore all their stories and, and tell them in, in, in a nice, cohesive manner. There's how many lighthouses still in existence on the New England coast and how many did you actually visit? 
Well, you're asking me specific questions now about everything, but um, no, that's totally Ball fine. Park. I believe it's, it's yeah, it's close to 200 um, lighthouses, I believe, are still standing. And and I didn't even get a chance to visit all of them. And and I think that's that's something a lot of lighthouse enthusiasts will do is that they they make it a, a, a plan in their life to visit every lighthouse that they possibly can. And there's a passport program that you can get stamps for all these oh. lighthouses and everything. So it's kind of a cool journey. Um but From I the was, I would association just, that you were just mentioning is they're the ones who created the passport thing program. I'm guessing. I, I'm not sure if they created it. Might I think it was the U uh, the U S Lighthouse Society. So they're actually based in in Washington um, State. Mm -hmm. And so I believe they created the passport program. But you can get it at, at different. Um, all these lighthouses are owned by by different nonprofits. Not they don't all fall under the same umbrella um, mm -hmm. of ownership. And some of them are privately owned. So so some you can access, some you can't. Um, but for me visiting lighthouses, I couldn't even give you a number, but it, it, that was kind of one of the great parts about, about this journey was even if there wasn't a specific person I was in touch with, I would just go travel to what felt like the edge of the earth in some of these locations like Marshall Point Lighthouse in Maine. Um, you're just driving down windy roads and you get out and all you see is just, you know, a few rocky islands out the coast and then it's just the horizon and blue skies and, and, and the, the vastness of the ocean. And that was like a really cool moment for me every time I got out to these places is you, you really felt like you were at the edge of the earth. Right. Um, so, uh, the folks who who live in some of these or visit, you know, take are the caretakers. Uh, there's a range of reasons why they would want to come, you know, come into um, possession of a lighthouse, right? Yeah, and and some of them are just are really passionate about preservation. Um, one right. of the characters in this film is is Ford Reiki. Um, he he bought Halfway Rock at auction, um, maybe in 2014 or 15, and he had a history of of just preservation efforts. Um, and he had you know grown up in in the Casco Bay area. And had traveled by boat around Halfway Rock, all, you know, all his life, and always wondered, you know, what was ever going to happen with this thing because it was completely, you know, dilapidated. It was, you know, the 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 ramp to get onto the island was washed away. the The windows in the lighthouse and the boathouse were were, you know, blown out. The roof was falling off. I mean, these these things are just in, you know, some of these lighthouses are in total decay for the last 30, 40, 50 years, and so. He, you know, once it came up for auction, he just felt like he was the right owner for it. And he and he truly was. What he did to that lighthouse is is nothing. I mean, it's a miracle what he did. And he's the guy who not only with the with the uh, inflated uh, raft, uh, you know, managing to get up that ramp. Right. But uh, also he's the one who's in the trailer uh, sitting yep. in, you know, I mean, obviously you're there with a camera, but he's basically sitting in solitude, giving you the idea, you know, having a cup of tea, coffee or tea or whatever. And giving the, you the idea of what of the kind of, uh, uh, you know, sort of vast solitude you can you can experience in one of these places. I mean, it's pretty, uh, pretty impressive, right? Yeah. And, and it's funny with that, that coffee gig, he, I, I filmed him <laughs> pouring coffee a couple of times. He was like, you really like coffee. And I actually do really love coffee, but it, <laughs> it is actually that moment of how many people get to sit out and have yeah, a exactly. cup of coffee, you know, 10 miles out in the ocean in a lighthouse. And so it was really unique, but like you saw in the trailer, getting onto that lighthouse was incredibly difficult. I mean, halfway rocks surrounded by 360 degrees of crashing waves, right? It's just that right. one little narrow pathway and you have to hit it. And there's actually a funny story of when we left one time, I went out there maybe three or four times um, to film. And one of the first times we were leaving, I didn't know how you really got off the island. And so really what we did is, you know, in the water, um, when the tide goes lower, uh, the boat, the ramp, you know, the boat is, is docked a little bit higher on the ramp and the ramp's really slippery from all the, you know, the algae that grows of on it and everything. Right, yeah. And so we, uh, we had slid down the ramp. That was the way to get off. It was almost like a toboggan. You kind of just hop in the boat and slide <laughs> off. And because that, that ramp had been washed away so many times, there was still some metal underneath. Um, you know, that used to hold the dock up and we punctured a hole in the raft and, yeah. you know, and I'm sitting there, you know, we kind of had to hop out of the boat and like knee deep, you know, waist deep water to kind of turn it around, try to get ourselves together. But I have all my gear in a backpack. Right. Um, I, I filmed this as a, you know, basically a one man band. Oh, yeah. And so everything was in a couple of backpacks that I owned and I didn't get, I didn't have water tight, you know, uh, no, backpacks right. before then, but shortly after now. I, I yeah, I bought a GoPro just to make sure that I was filming with a camera that could go underwater at times and things like that. So it was a it was quite the adventure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that 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 comes across pretty loud and clear. So I was going to ask you that, but you are you were a one man crew, right? You were doing all yeah. your your own camera work. Absolutely. There was um, a couple interviews. I had um, some some friends in the industry that were willing to to come along on just a weekend day to shoot, you know, two or three interviews just to make mm -hmm. sure we, you know, I wanted some movement in some of the interviews. Um, they were really important storytellers that kind of drive this film um 
that aren't necessarily main characters, but they're just great historians and storytellers. And um, I wanted to make sure I, I, you know, gave their their performances some life. So I did get a couple uh, filmmakers to help me out on some of those longer form interviews. But yeah, for the most part, I mean, when you're going out to some of these places at three, four, five in the morning, it's it, at a day's notice. It's hard to get people to jump on board with you, you know, during a, a work week or anything to come out. And that was the case for a lot of these was going out at 4 a.m., you know, on a Wednesday morning and just right. piling everything in a couple of backpacks and, and going out there. Right. There are, you know, we mentioned a couple of the historians who have written about the, you know, the New England lighthouses and, um, you know, there's picture books and, uh, you know, there are these folks who, who you know, um, use the passport um, program and try to visit as many as they can. But, um, would you say that this idea that the lighthouses are, you know, some of them are still in need of preservation efforts, is that an under, is that still an undertold story? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And and it's, I do think in some instances, uh, these lighthouses do fall in the wrong hands. And it's not, I don't think it's by purpose on some of these people. It's just, if it's um, city owned, it can get lost in the budget. Um, personally, that's a very big undertaking for some people. I know some people who have sat on them for five, six, 10 years, um, but are now deciding to make that leap. Um, some that were inspired by the film, which is really cool. Some that mm -hmm. were inspired by other people in the film that they, that they became friends with, which is really great. Um, it's, there's, it's unreal what goes into preservation. Um, and then for some of these offshore lighthouses, it's incredibly difficult to get out to. So you're adding that factor. And I mean, if you spend a day at the beach, you know, you, you come back and you feel like you're covered in, in salt and your hair is sticking straight up. I mean, now imagine this for a lighthouse that's been out there for 100, 200 years. It's, it's pretty <laughs> incredible that they can stand the test of time. But, you know, Mother Nature always wins, I think, in, this, in some of these instances. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned how Stones of the Quarries, your short film from a few several years ago, inspired the making of this one. Is it? Have you like triggered a, like an ongoing process? Like, do you know what your next project is going to? I always hate it when people ask me what my next project is, but I'm going to do it to you because the, because of that. You know, I mean, are you? Um, do you have any idea what you might work on next? Would it be? Do you want a total break from the sort of, you know, the natural elements of New England uh, of New England and to do something totally different, or do you want to stick stick somehow along those lines? Yeah, I I probably wish I could could try to do something different outside of New England, but I think it's it's so embedded in my soul of of wanting to explore, you know, our coastlines and our woods and our you know our trails and everything. It's just. It's something I've always enjoyed doing. Um, I joke that my wife might might leave me if I if I do another feature film, but I think she would support <laughs> it as well in the end of it if I told her I needed to do it. I don't. I am taking a break. I do have a two year old, um, and so yeah. I want to. I, I enjoy watching him grow. I mean, this project was was five years of of right. you know it because mm -hmm. it was so difficult to plan. But I don't have a a plan for another film at the moment. I'm still seeking out what that that topic might be. I want to make sure I can do it a little bit quicker than than five years. Right. Yeah. Exactly. What's your wife's name? Uh, Jocelyn. All right, Jocelyn. Let him work on the next one when he's ready. When he comes up with a good idea. <laughs> I like James. I'm going to call you all the time now. Whenever I need to do something, I'll have you uh, be the voice of reason. He said for... he said it was okay. Yeah, exactly. James said it was okay. <laughs> um, thanks a lot, Rob, for being with us. Um, I, um, you know, we look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks. Once again, folks, festival starts on September 17th. Um, looking forward to uh, having you join us then. And uh, Rob, thanks for joining us now. And um, um, we will see you soon. Uh, we would like to just uh, take a moment to thank our chief sponsors and uh, we'll see you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me.